further ado, Will Martin, a senior research fellow here at IFBRI, and he will deliver the keynote address. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Rajul, for that very kind introduction. It's a great pleasure to have such a wonderful audience here today, despite the competing attractions and entertainment options um, uh, on, in this city uh, today. So, um, <clears throat> so a key issue here, um, a key group of developing countries has grown incredibly fast over the last 25 years. This seems normal to many of us now, but as we'll see, it wasn't the norm at all. This has major impacts on food demand, production, policies and trade, and I'll go through some of those um, uh, in the presentation. Um, what are the implications then for agricultural economics and for development policy? One of the unfortunate features of my previous presentations on the road before bringing the show back uh, here to you know, the way they do with Broadway plays, you put them off Broadway first, uh, um, so, was that I didn't have the opportunity to get comments. So I'm really looking forward to excellent discussant comments today and general discussion on the topics uh, at hand. So a roadmap, economic convergence, then convergence in food demand, convergence in food production, and finally, convergence in agricultural policies and trade. All of these are issues that have important implications uh, for IFPRI. Economic convergence. Now, as Moses Abramovitz pointed out in the, in the mid-1980s, when we first began to have data to analyse these questions, um, poorer countries should be able to grow faster than richer countries. If you're a poorer country, you're operating inside the production possibility frontier, um, you have the opportunity of increasing your income by moving out towards the production possibility frontier. If you're a rich country, you're on the production possibility frontier. You can only grow by um, uh, increasing, by moving out the production possibility frontier through the development of new technologies. So poor countries should catch up and incomes should converge. So what did we see since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution? We saw exactly the opposite, something that was characterised rather um, nicely by Lant Pritchett with his point, what we saw was divergence big time, much faster growth in the rich countries than in the poorer countries. So what we saw was ever larger gaps between rich and, and poor countries. And this, of course, had dismal implications for inequality, poverty, life expectancy, um, social development. Just to, to quantify this a little bit, if you go back to 1820, um, the income per capita in the rich countries, and this is based on Angus Madison's work, um, was about twice uh, the income in, in the poorer countries. Angus Madison identified a set of industrial countries, 12 Western European countries, four European offshoots, Australia, Canada, uh, New Zealand and the United States, and then Japan, which managed to make the big leap into an industrial country status beginning in around 1860. But almost no other country was able to do. Um, over the period, though, the gap between rich and poor countries increased and increased. Now, the growth rates are not the sort of ballistic growth rates we've seen recently. The difference was that in the rich countries, income per capita growth was growing about 1.6% per year on average over the period. In poor countries, about 0.9. But this created the enormous gaps in income that we saw. That, that multiple poor countries, rich countries had double the income of poor countries at the beginning in 1820 and more than six times by the end um, in 1990. Um, now, key models of development, economists were struggling to work with this, understand this after World War II, um, and of course um, the, uh, <clears throat> the classic model uh, economic development with unlimited supplies of labour. Um, what that led you to was the idea that you might want to tax agriculture and use the revenues to develop an import-competing uh, 
uh, import substituting industrial structure, the Lewis model. Um, more, more subsequently, important scholars on this, uh, John Mellor, for instance, and T.W. Schultz pointed out that agricultural growth is absolutely vital. Agricultural growth, productivity growth, something to which the CG system has been, uh, of, of which IFPRI is a part, have been absolutely critical. And T.W. Schultz's point, farmers are poor but efficient, so if you tax them, they will reduce their output, so you'll suffer. Um, the, the, under the Lewis model, the idea was you could tax them without reducing agricultural uh, output. And then the outward orientation perspective, uh, emphasised uh, very, very strongly by Ann Kruger. Um, the idea here was you shouldn't tax agriculture and you should document the taxation of agriculture. That led to the kruger schiff valdez work. Um, uh, at the World Bank and subsequent agricultural incentives, uh, the Kim Anderson work and agricultural incentives work. We're continuing as a consortium um, with the World Bank and IFPRI uh, and the Asian Development Bank and FAO and OECD. But the idea of developing manufacturers exports, that started to become obvious that that was possible uh, in the 70s and 80s in, in East Asia. Now why have we seen this change. Recently we've seen this rapid growth in developing countries. Now several models have been put forward. Why, why is this? One thing is the, the demographic dividend. Bloom and Williamson point to that in particular. Another point that's emphasised in a recent working paper by Doug Gollan, Hansen and Wingender, um, large GDP gains coming from adoption of high yielding varieties uh, around the world. Agricultural productivity rising, we knew that that tended to give you very large reductions in poverty. Martin Revalian's work and other scholars' work points that out, how important um, that can be. I think this paper really emphasises the impact of productivity growth in agriculture for overall GDP growth. I think one thing that's important here is that it frees up labour um, for manufacturing and, and services. Since the early 1990s, and, and this is Richard Baldwin's uh, paper on the Great Convergence, a book rather, um, he points to the importance of global production sharing. You've got containerization, you've got fast transport, um, and relatively low cost transport and you have as well as that communication so that you can break up the production process and, and locate manufacturing and service activities where you have comparative advantage. You don't have to build the entire industrial structure um, from coal and iron at one end to a Model T Ford at the other as was the traditional pattern in industrial development and something which as Danny Roderick points out was astoundingly difficult to do, that only Japan was really able to develop the whole thing, um, that to start off not as a, one of the advanced economies and to get there um, by that whole process of industrial development. So this global production, global value chain is much easier than developing integrated industrial structures. Um, the demographic story, the timing here is not quite matching um, the takeoff uh, in, in the world. You see in this, in this um, little graph, this is from the UN population projections, um, you see in China and East Asia more generally a very big rise in the working, uh, working age share of the population which tends to drive um, these demographic uh, impacts once the birth rate starts to fall during the demographic transition. You see this bonus, the demographic graphic dividend of a rise in the working age population uh, that starts from the 1970s rather than starting from the 1990s. So the timing is not quite right. Uh, it doesn't also fit with Latin America. You've had a big demographic dividend, not quite as big as East Asia, but you haven't had um, the same sort of takeoff. There are another couple of interesting things in this little graph. One is the extent of the, div the, the negative demographic dividend coming up uh, for the industrial countries, the green, the green line there as the share of the workforce declines and the implications that has uh, for those. Another um, is the, the start of the demographic dividend for sub-Saharan Africa, um, the bottom line there 
um, which is likely to last a very, very long time. If countries can adopt policies to take advantage of that the way East Asia managed to do. So um, coming now to this growth takeoff, um, if you, you uh, we saw those very long series uh, back to 1820 from Angus Madison. Um, if you update from 1951 where you've got a much bigger coverage of countries, what you see is that most of the time um, the industrial countries still continue to grow on average faster than developing countries. There's the green uh, line there, there are occasional periods in the, in the early 70s where the industrial countries were growing slowly, developing countries grew a little faster, but on average the industrial countries grew faster. Than the, than the developing countries. And you had the locomotive and the caboose model of the world economy. Um, the idea was developing countries could really only grow if the rich countries grew and, pull, and pulled them uh, along. So different from the model we've used in the last 25 years when the growth engines have tended to be um, in the developing countries. In this period mm, here, which... Uh, well, anyway, <laughs> uh, the pointer. Um, <clears throat> but what you see this extraordinary gap in growth rates. These are smooth growth rates, very volatile series. But the, these gaps here are, are quite astounding, quite different uh, order of magnitude from the gap we saw historically, that little that gap of, of about 0.9 of a percent um, between 1820 and 1990. Now, this... Uh, growth is particularly rapid um, in uh, Asia, um, China, India, other East Asia, other South Asia, all growing much faster. Um, up until about uh, 2000, there's really no evidence of unconditional convergence where the poor countries, um, uh, without focusing on convergence clubs and so on, where poor countries grow faster than rich countries. There is some evidence of that since about um, 2000. But it's a still quite a heterogeneous pattern here. Um, Europe and Central Asia, on average, growing a little faster than the, than the industrial countries, the rich countries, the yellow line. Middle East, North Africa, um, and Latin America, more or less keeping up. Sub-Saharan Africa, also more or less. Um, keeping up, different from the historical pattern, but the strong concentration of the growth um, in Asia is particularly evident. Um, now, the, the, the last line, the last few observations there suggest that maybe this is all passing, but in fact, um, uh, the funds projections going out to 2023 at least suggest continued strong growth in Asia, developing Europe, and a, a worrying slowdown. Uh, in sub-Saharan Africa. Moving along, um, what does all this mean for agricultural economics? Now, one thing it means is we get these shifts in, in food demand. Um, we, we get shifts away from basic staple foods towards fruits, vegetables, oil seeds, and livestock products. And the livestock product demand increases the demand, the, the resource demands on agriculture enormously. Um, we get sharp increase in demand for total calories in low and middle income countries. Uh, and of course, we get no increase in demand in the rich countries. Um, the total demand for food is, is concave. If income growth is higher in poor countries, then overall food demand will grow more rapidly. Um, if you look at total calorie consumption, this is not the calories consumed. It's the calories required to produce the food that's consumed. Um, that continues to grow until very high income levels, around 50,000 per person. Um, <clears throat> direct calorie consumption, fortunately, peaks much, much earlier, at around 10,000 uh, US dollars per person, 2005 dollars. It doesn't grow much after that, very fortunately, because otherwise people would be unable to get out the door um, after, the, the, after this seminar um, in a country with income levels um, up, up here. But it's that shift into livestock products that has this immense impact on, on demand, especially if the livestock products are beef or sheep meats um, uh, or, or dairy products, which really require enormous amounts of calories uh, per unit of calorie consumed. Um, 
One of the things this means is that um, if we look at projections going out to 2050 and, and um, my co-author Emika Fukasi and I um, use the IASA, IASA projections for that, that it looks to us as though per capita consumption increases will be more important than population increases. Population growth uh, out to 2050. Population growth is slowing down, except in Africa, it's slowing down. Uh, sorry, uh, very, very dramatically. Um, what we find is that per, uh, total food demand seems to be very, very sensitive to the rate of convergence embodied in your forecast. When we, I see uh, food projections uh, presented or discussed, I very rarely see anything, what's the rate of convergence, um, economic convergence, in or he see or hear anything about the rate of convergence, economic convergence underlying those projections of food demand. Convergence and nutrition, animal source foods can have important nutritional benefits, especially avoiding stunting among children. Some recent work pointing to big benefits from dairy products, for instance, in avoiding um, heart disease. Um, but convergence in food demand creates some health challenges. Processed foods and sugar can be so, so tasty and so bad for you. Um, <clears throat> now, a double burden of malnutrition, some still suffering undernutrition, others with obesity and non-communicable diseases, and then, of course, the third burden of malnutrition associated with micronutrient deficiencies. Convergence in food demand, developing country growth and food production. Now, the improvements in policies that underlay these improvements in economic performance raise productivity in agriculture. As well as that, growth in many developing countries has expanded investments in research and development. Half of public world public uh, R&D, agricultural R&D, is now in middle income countries, especially in Brazil, India and China. My suspicion, and this is only a suspicion, is that rapid economic growth in developing countries increases food demand a lot, but it also increases food production as well. And that, I think, is a uh, pretty reasonable hypothesis. What about agricultural yields, a combination of the innovations from the CG system, investments in national agricultural research and development systems? Um, if you look at yield growth, that started, to this, and this is a very aggregate measure, this is world agricultural output, agricultural output, sorry, at world prices divided by agricultural land in rich and in poor countries, that started to grow faster the level was lower, it started to grow faster um, in developing countries in the 1960s when the very first varieties started to become available, improved varieties become available from the International Agricultural Research Centres. Um, it grew faster and then it really took off um, again from about the 1990s. Now I think at that stage, um, and Derek Byerley is, is the person, I think by that time um, the adoption of the improved varieties had actually already gone quite, quite a long way. So this, this is an interesting development of very high. Uh, this, I think, is just the problem of incomplete data. And, um, I hope that's right. Convergence in policies and trade. I'm running short of time. Policies from the 1940s to the 1970s, the 80s were described as agriculture and disarray. Now, the rich countries often raised farm prices, insulated domestic from world prices, variable import levies, export subsidies, my country first. Um, developing countries often taxed agriculture, insulated domestic prices from world prices, um, and many countries hadn't read Amartya Sen's famous work, um, used import quotas, export bans, contributed to famines and market instability. Um, the Uruguay Round helped really change this. I mean, Alan Winters and I did a book on this. It really changed things dramatically in the rich countries. Bindings on tariffs, bans on variable levies, limits on distorting support. Um, there was little focus on developing countries. Um, protection there was generally negative to agriculture. Trade was relatively small. There wasn't a lot of interest in opening markets. Now, now, since then, protection rates in the rich countries peaked in the mid-1990s 
and have since declined. Growth in income and agricultural production fueled rapid growth in developing country trade, and many developing countries have reduced their taxation of agriculture and started to move uh, to agricultural protection. And there are good political economy reasons to expect that. So with this, this graph that's taken uh, from Kim Anderson's work that goes back to 1955 um, and the more recent agricultural incentives uh, project, what you see is the rise in agricultural protection in the rich countries, the green line, up till um, the mid-1980s, reached those staggering levels that really had to be disciplined by um, uh, by the Uruguay round and provided the stimulus. So you had competing export subsidies and other uh, very messy interventions. In developing countries at that time, protection was still negative um, until the early 90s. Protection on average to agriculture in developing countries was negative. Um, but now these lines have essentially uh, reached uh, the same point. Developing countries have started, on average, to, to protect fairly substantially. Another thing that's another feature of this graph is that when world prices went up, protection came down. And that happened in rich and poor countries. In the rich countries, it was kind of mechanical, things like the variable levies. As prices went down, protection um, went up. Uh, but, of course, all that does is exacerbate the world price volatility. It doesn't uh, reduce domestic volatility, it just exacerbates the world price volatility. Um, the direction of agricultural trade. When you, when you think about the, the agricultural policy debates um, of the past, they were pretty much all about one rich country's exports to another. So if you look at developed country exports in 1993, when the Uruguay round was about finished, um, to developed countries, they, that was about 32% of world trade. This is outside the, the European Union, which where trade um, is not subject to trade policies. Um, so there was, there was still something worth arguing about. US exports to Japan, US exports of agricultural products, um, uh, to, to Europe, for instance. And it was only a minor, it was only you know, a fraction of world trade. Um, develop, developing countries were about 40% of world exports and world imports. And the developed countries were about 60%. When you move to 2016, just this short time, the, the <coughs> burst of growth in developing countries, um, what you're now seeing, and this is the same set of developed and developing countries, that country, exports from one developed country to another is about 14% of world exports. There's really no basis of world trade. There's really no basis for a serious negotiation based just on that tiny fraction um, of world trade. Developing countries are about 60% of world exports and imports. Um, the world has changed astoundingly um, over, over that, uh, over that uh, short period nearly 25 years. So agriculture, I'm worried, is heading back towards disarray. These increases in protection, the use of insulation to stabilize domestic prices, as we saw in 2008 with export bans in countries like India, um, and, <clears throat> and import duty reductions in many importing countries. Very sensible for the individual country but it destabilizes world prices. And there's still an alarming number of countries using quotas, um, export bans, and so on, um, focus on food availability. These tend not to work to satisfy the objectives of the country, and they still destabilize world prices. We need an agenda for collective action. This seems a crazy time to propose such a thing at a period of totally unilateral action being proposed by the United States. I think it's also important to remember that it's always darkest before the dawn. There were only four years between the Smoot-Hawley tariffs, which was the last great trade disaster um, involving the United States, and the beginning of reciprocal uh, tariff cuts um, in 1934. There's going to be an opportunity and a need, though, for developing countries to take the lead on future trade negotiations. Um, They'll, they'll need analytical support 
like the analytical support to trade negotiators provided by D. Gale Johnson's work on agriculture in disarray in the 1970s and 1980s. So to conclude, um, rapid growth and partial convergence transforming the agricultural sectors and they're creating exciting new research agendas. Convergence in food demand, the big increase in livestock consu product consumption um, really raises food demand and puts a lot of pressure on agricultural resources. That'll have important implications for agricultural uh, demand and, and for environmental uh, impacts. Convergence in agricultural productivity is, is very important and we're seeing, we're seeing a lot of that but we're going to need a lot more work to keep that going. R&D investments and rural infrastructure improvements uh, are important elements there. Um, we're seeing some really radical changes in policies and trade patterns. I think policy convergence is actually leading us to some collective action problems and need for reform. And I look forward very much to comments, uh, questions and discussion. Thank you.